Welcome to Fahrenheit AI, episode 10. This episode was originally recorded live at ISS in Long Beach, California. If you were there, thank you so much for joining the AI conversation. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence leverages computers and machines to mimic the problem-solving and decision-making capabilities of the human mind. On the left is the Ink Kitchen logo, developed in Korea. It uses the original Ink Kitchen logo and a prompt to create the image. On the right is an AI podcast image created by Dolly and ChatGPT. There are three different types of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence that will assist us, artificial intelligence that will replace us, and artificial intelligence that will do things that we could never do without it. Let's focus on the assist us type. One of the easiest places to get started using AI is in marketing. I created this headshot of myself by sending out about 30 images to a service, and they returned about 30 images of my face. Only one of them sort of looked like me. On the right is a social media post that was created by Replit. This is an AI that took all of the information from the episode, atomized it by creating some key points, specifically how many likes the video has, how many views the video has, and how many comments. Then it created a call to action. It did not post the message. I had to physically do that. But this is an easy entry point for using AI, using it for social media creating images, or creating posts. AI uses large language models to do this. A large language model, or an LLM, are very large, deep learning models that are pre-trained on vast amounts of data. That's how it's able to compile all of the data into a post that is coherent and effective. Here is another example, video to blog, where you take a YouTube video and have AI create a blog post. People use different methods of learning. They can see it as a video like this, or they could see it as a blog and read the content. The AI did a very good job. It broke everything down into the different sections. It reviewed all the different concepts that were in the video, and it was coherent. The tools that I've used in marketing include Replit, where I generated the social media post, Video to Blog, which we discussed, GPT-4, which is the large language model that's connecting to each of these. Refusion is a cool one where it will actually sing what you type. And Kyber was used to generate animation, so it's a way to bring some of your images to life. Another easy place to get started is in generative AI artwork. I actually got started pretty early on doing illusions. So you can check out episode 2 of Fahrenheit to learn how to do this. On the left is my dog, Gus, who was a Tibetan terrier, and I considered an evil mastermind. And on the right is my dog, Pearl, who is a princess and a golden doodle. I obviously have a type. Illusion images help you learn because you have to combine together prompts and previously generated images in effective ways to create an illusion. Illusions teach you how to prompt and teach you how to choose AI, generated art, better so that you get an effective illusion. It'll actually kind of boot camp you through understanding AI generative art. The next space I learned in episode three of Fahrenheit was all about text. I do recommend Ideogram right now as the best AI generative text tool. Then I learned how to do what I would call stealing. I created this image for DTF using a Muddy Waters album that I took into Illustrator and used the retype tool to basically copy the font and layout and then adjust it to this version. One of the challenging spots with generative AI is the lack of control. Artists want more control in the space and not to be so generic. In order to get that control, there are tools in generative AI that you can use, namely stable diffusion. Across the top, you can see a wireframe of the image on the left, and across the bottom, you see a contour map of the image on the left. The images on the right are generated using the map and the wireframe in addition to a prompt. So the wireframe plus astronaut created the image on the right at the top. The contour map plus alien figure created the image on the right at the bottom, 
but you can see how they're taking data from the image on the left, which was the original image. This starts to build control. Another way you can gain control is to use some of the sketching AI tools. On the left in this image is a rose that I drew, and on the right is the AI. The AI regenerates the image as I draw it. It adds perfection to the image. It kind of stylizes it in my style, but creates a more refined image. In this way, you can incorporate AI into your current tasks. You can also bring in existing artwork and make corrections using AI very quickly. If I was to start again today, I would start in an area of generative AI artwork that gave me the most control. Here's an example of where I did that. On the left, there's a 50-year-old logo of a tree that this farm has used, and they asked me for something new, and I generated what is on the right. I did the background using their mission statement, the text I created myself, not using generative AI. And then the tree, I used the control and I used their logo and generated a tree that matched the image shape of their original logo and also looked like the actual tree at their farm. Unfortunately, the customer thought this looked super AI generated. That's one of the problems that's coming up now as we get further down the road with this tool. It's very recognizable. It's the same each time. Generative AI tools that I use are Adobe Photoshop Beta, Adobe Illustrator Retype Beta, Dolly, Crea, which is the IK image at the beginning of the episode. It has the scribble ability like the rose, Krita, which is another one that does scribble, like the rose. I would say today that Crea is easier to use because it's online and it's free when you get started. Ideogram is awesome with text. Then you have the old standards, Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion. Keep in mind, a lot of these are just reworks of Stable Diffusion. So Crea and Krita are just versions of Stable Diffusion that are more user-friendly and accessible. Recently, Billy Strings released his New Year's t-shirt apparel and was accused of using generative AI artwork. He asked the artist that created it if it was AI, and the artist said that it was not. Billy Strings asked for proof, the original sketches. The artist has not yet produced those, so moving forward, it may be important to keep evidence of your artwork because it may be questioned as to where it came from which is sort of sad. What is machine learning? Machine learning, or ML, is a subset of AI that can learn without following explicit instructions by inferring patterns in data using statistical models and algorithms. Examples of machine learning include social media feeds, product recommendations, and image recognition. Recently, machine learning has been used by scientists in fingerprint analysis. Scientists are able to identify when fingerprints come from the same hand, whereas previously they were only able to identify when they came from the exact same finger. Now they can cross-analyze against other crimes to see if that hand was present in a different crime. Maybe it's only a partial of a different finger, but they can start to identify if the same criminal had previous unconvicted crimes. On the right is a tool called LumiTool. It's a laser engraver that has MidJourney built into it. You can actually generate images on MidJourney. It'll posterize them and then engrave them onto a surface all in one step. What is deep learning? Deep learning is essentially a neural network with three or more layers. These neural networks attempt to simulate the behavior of the human brain. It allows for them to learn from large amounts of data. So with deep learning, you can consider that there's multiple layers of data that the AI is accessing, and it's creating and inferring patterns and conclusions out of the data, like the human brain. It's able to use data that isn't structured, like on a spreadsheet or in an orderly format. A multimodal agent is an agent that has different ways of communicating with us. It can see, it can hear, it can speak. 
It also has a large language model and deep learning capabilities so that it has a vast amount of data to access. Then you can feed in your own data, your own model, your own homegrown information that it can use to become a specialty agent. This is how you start to build your own agents like Siri and Alexa, except they're for your shop or your life. They know you. We started exploring this in episode five. I used the game of Clue as a creative aspect to understand AI agents. There was a user proxy. He was the butler, Wadsworth. He's the one that talks to all the other agents and communicates with us. There was a learning agent. There was a researcher that could do code. There was an expert. An expert would be one that is in your shop that knows your shop. It could also be an expert for a vendor like Stalls, for example. Then your user proxy would go back and forth and speak to your expert and their expert to come to a conclusion based on what you prompted it to do, like find full color hat transfers, for example. So what is big data? Big data refers to the data sets that are too large or complex to be handled by traditional data processing software. Big data is a combination of structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. Examples of big data include customer databases, all the information posted on social media, and a trade data from the New York Stock Exchange, for example. So you can see it's a variety of data that's combined together. It gives you new information. Imagine if an AI ran for president. That would be terrifying to have machines taking over. It has no empathy for the human race. We're so reliant on machines, we can't even determine our own fate. That is a really scary prospect. But then take a step and imagine if the president had an AI assistant, an AI agent that was an expert in its field. It had access to vast amounts of data, structured and unstructured. So it's able to represent more of the human condition. The assistant is able to compile understanding from vast amounts of information that could assist decision makers and policymakers in understanding something that maybe they don't understand because their scope can't be that wide. This is a tool that could help you grow and maybe provide some relief. There are many scary aspects to this as well, and we're going to look at those in the future. As we discover policy, we discover privacy, and we discover what's different about this AI intelligence that we're building versus the actual human mind. One of the easiest places to get started with AI agents is in the ChatGPT store. They have GPTs that represent all kinds of different modalities. So you can type in anything that you're interested in. Matt Marcotte has built one for the screen print industry called Screen Print GPT. I'm building one that's an expert in separations to be a separation assistant. I'm doing this by using Script Listener from Photoshop. I perform a separation and I give that to the AI so that it can learn. In the future, I will provide it with mistakes and I will provide it with more details based on questioning. What is natural language search? Natural language search is a type of search method that allows users to interact with a computer system or search engine using everyday language instead of a formalized search. Recent advances in AI, such as large language models and foundation models, have largely been about using vast repositories of unstructured data in new ways. So what does this mean? This means that the keyword and SEO of the past is going to slowly start to change because we can use natural language. It means that we can have a conversation like we're having with each other, with an AI. This is also happening in the medical field. Unstructured data is being analyzed now from doctor's notes. In the past, this would take a lot of time for it to be transcribed, but now because of AI, it's able to analyze the notes and get people into specific studies or treatments that they may not have had access to in the past. I created an AI agent that could post to LinkedIn. I used Autogen Studio because this is one of the places that I started, and it has a UI now that allows me to do the generation without as much code. It created an interesting post to encourage someone to explore Fahrenheit AI Episode 7. It gave me a link, but there wasn't much to it. 
It wasn't very directed. It was too generic. So I went to chat GPT and I created a persona for my agent, which was a marketing executive that had 20 years of experience. I gave my agent roles and responsibilities and marketing strategies. Then it created a new post and it actually posted it to my LinkedIn. It said, dive into the latest Fahrenheit AI episode where we explore real world AI applications from an AI that sings your text to innovative visual systems for mushroom harvesting. This episode covers the fascinating intersection of AI and creativity. Learn how AI is reshaping art, marketing, and even the apparel industry. Don't miss out on our discussion about generative AI, AI powered social media marketing, and a user-friendly AI embellishment calculator for the apparel industry. Tune in now to discover how AI is revolutionizing our world. It made emojis, it gave me hashtags, it posted it to LinkedIn. All I did was say, review episode seven. Thanks so much, you guys. It's the end of the world, we know it. It's the end.